This morning, if you'd allow me, I'd like the privilege of sharing for a few minutes with you about God's school of compassion. God's school of compassion. You have a bifold with you today. You'll see a very familiar passage of scripture in Luke chapter 15. And that's where we're going to take our text today. And I want to read to you just these first two verses before we dive in. Luke 15, verses 1 and 2. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. The word prodigal is an interesting word. It doesn't appear in this text, but we refer to Luke chapter 15 as the chapter that deals with lostness. Jesus is teaching, and in chapter 14, large crowds have come to hear him, and towards the end of chapter 14, he preaches a very hard word. He oftentimes would do that when the crowds got large, and the crowds would naturally begin to thin. When he said things like, you have to forsake everything and follow me, well, people began to trickle away. So in chapter 14, towards the end, he's preaching a very hard word. The crowd's beginning to thin. And then the very last verse of chapter 14, he says this, those of you who have ears to hear, hear. And then seamlessly, he goes into chapter 15 with those two verses that we just read. And in Luke chapter 15, Jesus tells three of the greatest stories ever told. The first story had to deal with a lost sheep. A shepherd has 100 sheep. One of them gets lost. The story is he takes the 99, leaves them, goes after the one until it is found. When it is found, he rejoices. He celebrates a picture of lost and found. The second story is about a woman who in her home lost a coin a very precious and important coin, part of her dowry in all likelihood. And so she looks high and low. She sweeps and cleans and looks under every speck of furniture. And then finally she finds the coin. She invites her lady friends over to have a hallelujah celebration party because the coin that was lost has now been found. And then Jesus comes in with the final story about the lost son. We call it the prodigal son. But we call it the prodigal son because the word prodigal means wasteful. And that's the story of what took place with this young man. This young man, who was not the firstborn to receive two-thirds of the inheritance, he was the secondborn. He comes to his dad one day and he says, Dad, I'm about had it. Would you right now give me my inheritance? And what he was saying in the culture of his day is, is this, Dad, you're as good as dead to me. Because that's when you receive the inheritance. But the father gave him his inheritance. And then the Bible tells us, I'm trying to summarize to shorten this up a little bit, that he went to a far country and spent all of his inheritance on riotous women. But basically what he does is, is he's, he's the center of the world at that time. He's throwing the lavish parties and, and he has all of these friends. And he really doesn't have these friends. He just has these friends because he's got a lot of money to spend and Finally, the story goes on that he spent every penny that he had. And the next thing you know, he finds himself working for someone else. He's feeding pigs. Now, if you know anything about being a Jewish boy, that's lower than low. But get this, guys. He's feeding them slop. And his hunger, his, his hunger is so great that he's looking at that slop in that trough and he's thinking to myself, himself, I'm about ready to dive in. That's how low he had fallen. But pick up the story with me, if you will, in verse 20. And he arose just prior to that. The scripture says that he, he came to himself. I don't know if you've ever been around pigs. They're not particularly clean and it stinks. But in the midst of slop and mud, manure and pigs, 
this young man comes to himself and he arose and came to his father. But while he was a still a long way off, his father saw him. Can I submit to you today that every day that dad went to that front porch, pulled out the binoculars and looked as far as he could towards the horizon every day. And then there was one day that he saw a silhouette and a familiar gait and he recognized that's my boy. But while he was still, that is the son, a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. You and I don't have a full appreciation for that because in the culture of that day, Jewish men didn't run anywhere. But on this day, he ran because he felt compassion and he embraced him and he kissed him. The prodigal son in this story represents all the tax collectors and sinners that we read about back in verses one and two who were repenting and coming to Jesus. The father represents God who is extending free and full forgiveness for everyone who was repenting. And he was thrilled to have each and every one come back. Jesus could have ended the story right there, guys. And we would have had some great theological truth about repentance and forgiveness. But he doesn't end the story there. And before we go any further, I want to say this this morning. If you're here today under the sound of my voice and you are away from God, if you are that prodigal, I want to say to you this morning that if you will just make a 180 degree turn from wherever you are headed, you have a heavenly father who will do just as this father did. He will make up the distance between where you are and where he is. And with open arms, he will embrace you and he will kiss you and he will welcome you. And he will throw a party in heaven for you. And you can do that today. And I pray that you will. You don't have to clean yourself up. Wipe off the dirt and the dust. You don't have to fix yourself up. You don't have to pick yourself up. The prodigal son didn't do any of that. You just need to turn to God in repentance. And when you do, he says, welcome home. But remember what precipitated Jesus' story. It was those hard-hearted rabbis who felt no compassion, no pity, no mercy for those tax collectors and sinners. And they represent character number three in our story. And that is the prodigal's older brother. We pick up the narrative in verse 25. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called to one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come home and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him pleaded with him, begged him, but he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, he didn't even say his brother, he put a distance between he and his brother. He said, when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, how did he know how the property was devoured? I don't know. 
He obviously was not in close communication with his younger brother, but somehow he knew what his younger brother was up to. And here you've killed the fattened calf for him. Now on the outside, this older brother had it all together. I mean, if you had a son like this older brother, you would think to yourself, hey, listen, he's responsible, he's obedient, he's dependable, he's a hard worker. On the outside, this older brother looked great. But on the inside, something was terribly missing. Here's his little brother who has just come home. He is beaten, battered, and bloodied by sin. His inheritance is gone. And he's just limped home on his very last leg. Was the older brother glad to see him? No. Was he touched by his little brother's plight and pain? No. Did he have any pity whatsoever for this human being in front of him who had lost everything? Not one speck. His heart was as cold as a slab of marble. So if the prodigal son represented all the tax collectors and sinners who were repenting and coming to Jesus, and the father represents our graceful, merciful, almighty, heavenly father, who then does the older brother represent? The answer to that question is this. All of those hard-hearted rabbis who were full of self-righteousness, standing there listening to Jesus teach, but utterly lacking in compassion. Luke 15, now verse 31. He said to him, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. And then Jesus abruptly ends the story right there. End of chapter, end of story. What happened to the older brother? Did he ever come in? Did he never come in? Oftentimes I wonder why did Jesus end the story like that? I mean, Jesus is a master storyteller. Master storytellers present us a problem. We see what's going on and then they bring a solution. But in this particular case, we're left hanging. What happened to the older brother? The reason why Jesus ended the story the way he did is because the end of the story was left up to the rabbis who were standing there listening. Would they come in? Would they celebrate? Would they soften their hearts and have compassion on those tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus like the father in our story, stood there that day pleading with the religious elitists to return. How sad it is, though, that most of those rabbis never changed their minds or their hearts and they never came into the party. Now, maybe you're thinking to yourself, Hutch, that's a good review of that story and I appreciate that. But what in the world... What in the world does that have to do with compassion? What in the world does that have to do with suffering? Well, remember we said the older brother looked good on the outside, but something was missing on the inside. What was missing on the inside? What was missing on the inside with the older brother is the same thing that was missing on the inside of all of those religious leaders there that day. And it can be summed up in one word, and that is the word compassion. Compassion. What is compassion? You might want to write this down. Compassion is the ability to identify with people in need. Compassion is the ability to identify with people in need or in pain and react in a caring way. Compassion is the ability to identify with people in need or in pain and react in a caring way. Jesus said something to Philip over in John chapter 14 and verse 9 that I want to remind you of this morning. And he said this, 
speaking to Philip, he said, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? And then notice this phrase, this sentence. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. If you ever want to know what is the heart of God, all you have to do is see how Jesus responded in every situation that he went into. Because when you see how Jesus responded, what you will see is the heart of God on full display. Look at these next verses here in your bifold. And here's what I want you to do with me, gentlemen. If you're asleep, I want you to wake up, elbow the guy next to you. Every time we come to the word compassion or compassionate, I need you to be at the Braves game. I need you to be at the ninth inning. I need you to be two outs, one more at bat. And then you hear the crack of the bat. That's the volume level I want to hear today. Do you understand? Do we have we communicated the message? In other words, I don't want to understand. No, we're yelling it out, okay? Every time you see this word, you say it. Matthew 9 and verse 36. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Matthew 14, 14. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them and he healed their sick. Matthew 20 and verse 34. Jesus had compassion on them and he touched their eyes and immediately they received their sight and followed him. James 5 and verse 11. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Guys, that is the heart of God, but it doesn't stop there because as his children, he wants you and I to have the very same heart that he is. So Let's do it again. It's so good. Uh, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12. Put on them as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts. Look at Ephesians 4 and verse 32. Be kind and to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ through God has forgiven you. First Peter three and verse eight. Finally, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be and humble. That's why Mother Teresa spent her life in Calcutta, India, working with the poorest of the poor. Compassion. That's why Corey Ten Boom hid Jewish people in her home in Holland in World War II to protect them from the Nazis. Compassion. That's why Wilbur Wilberforce Spent his entire life and he saw it completed to try to end slavery throughout the British Empire. Compassion. That's why Johnny Erickson Tata to this day sends wheelchairs and ministers to people with disabilities all around the world because that's how God wants us to be. Now, maybe you're thinking, you say, Hutch, I hear what you're saying. But whenever people use words to describe me, compassion is not a word that comes to mind. How do I become compassionate? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. Second Corinthians chapter one, look at it there in your notes. Verse three, praise be to the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of compassion and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves have received from God. What 2 Corinthians chapter 1 tells us, guys, is this. Compassion is a learned skill. Compassion is a learned skill. And he teaches us compassion by sending us through the furnace of affliction, trials, suffering, pain, heartache, and loss. It is suffering that teaches us how to connect with people in pain. It is suffering that tenderizes our hearts to the weak and those in need, to the downcast, 
the helpless, the poor, the orphan, the widow, the person with a disability. Nobody ever learned compassion from success. We learn compassion only through the furnace of suffering. In 1988, I was 24 years old, two years removed from my college education, serving full time at a church in Atlanta, in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I was a campus pastor at the Christian school to pay the bills. It was a gray overcast Friday morning when I went to work. And at 1020, I left my office, walked to my classroom, and began to take roll. While taking roll, I heard what sounded like M80s going off in the courtyard of the church. The way the church was designed is there was a worship center, educational wing, educational wing, four portable trailers in the courtyard. My office was in this one. The class I taught was in this room. A 60 foot trailer, 13 feet wide, one wall in the middle, making two classrooms. As I heard those noises, I looked out the window behind me and I saw our assistant principal, a man named Sam Marino, and his head was at about doorknob height and he was saying something, but I couldn't hear what he said. So I walked over to the door, I opened up the door, I took one step out and I heard Sam say, help, he shot me, he shot me. Then I looked down that courtyard and I saw a 16 year old young man who I had just marked absent in my class walking our direction. He had in his hand what looked like an Uzi water pistol, but he walked up to Sam. He was eight to 10 feet away from him. He pulled the trigger, shot Sam, missed his heart by half of an inch. He had just been in that room a moment earlier and shot Sam in the shoulder. There was another lady teacher who was there who left. As she ran away, this young man chased her and shot at her. She got away. After shooting Sam, I pulled the door to, locked it, told the 30 plus 10th, 11th and 12th graders to get down and get back. That's exactly what they did. As I watched this young man who I knew, I began to pray that he would not enter the room. But he went from Sam to our classroom, up the stairs. He tried the door, it was locked. He shot the glass out, reached in, unlocked the door. And as soon as he came in, I called him by name and tried to talk him down. He would not stop. He walked up to the 30 plus kids who were on the floor up against the wall. He looked at one and he called him by name. He said, this is for you. I'm going to kill you. And he pulled the trigger, the gun jammed. He took two steps back, jiggled the clip. I was over here by that window and the Holy Spirit said, go. And I ran towards this young man as hard and fast as I could. I was three to four feet away from him when the gun went off. I thought the bullet had gone past my left ear because for the next three days, my left ear was ringing. But later we discovered that the bullet went between the two of us. Through one wall, across the courtyard, through a second wall, got stuck in a third wall. I hit him so hard against that wall that divided that trailer into two. There was a bookshelf on the other side, knocked every book off of that bookshelf, popped the paneling loose on our side. I grabbed him by his coat and his shirt and I threw him head first into the wall. He fell to the ground, the gun fell out of his hand. I got down on top of him. He said, let me up, let me up, I don't have the gun. Just in the emotion of the moment, I just reared back and punched him in the mouth. He collapsed to the floor. I laid on top of him. One of the other students came, grabbed the gun and got it out. Two teachers came by hearing of the commotion, saw two sets of feet in the doorway. One took off his belt, wrapped up his feet. The other one got on top of me, he said, Hutch, I was afraid you were gonna faint, you're as white as a sheet. Yet the entire time I was talking to him, I said, why would you do this? And he listed off a name of teachers, students, and administration that he planned on killing that day. He brought with him that day a Cobra 911 millimeter semi-automatic handgun with 96 rounds of ammunition 
three Molotov cocktails and a pipe bomb. Fast forward two years. I'm now 26. Cindy's 22. We are expecting our firstborn son. When the pediatrician, after he had been delivered, strolls him into the room, I can see it as clear as if it was yesterday. Cindy's laying in the bed. I'm on one side. Cindy's mom is on the other side. The pediatrician tells us there are some physical things that cause us to believe that your son may have Down syndrome. We have to run some tests to make for certain. But he has a fleshiness on the back of his neck. He has a semi-increase in the palm of his hands. And he's what we call floppy. After giving us that news, she left. And we cried. Fast forward two years, two and a half. I'm now 28 years old. And I'm at Eggleston Hospital. And I'm handing my two and a half year old son to an anesthetician that I have never met before. Who takes my son back because he was born with two holes in his heart and a bad valve. And they cracked his chest open, repaired the two holes, fixed the valve. And the absolute hardest thing I have ever done, gentlemen, in my lifetime was when my son was in recovery to, to go in and to see him. He had tubes coming out of every place in his body. He's two and a half years old. He's strapped down. And as hard as that was, when I went back and they were weaning him off of the anesthesia, and that little two and a half year old boy with a tube down his throat his arms and his legs strapped to a table, tells me with his eyeballs, Dad, pick me up, get me out of here. And I could not do it because if I did, I would hurt him in an immeasurable way. Suffering has and is continuing to change me every day. Compassion, God-honoring, Christ-like compassion has to be learned. And the only way, guys, for you and I to learn it is to walk through the doorway of suffering. And I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but that's the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. But there's hope. God gives me and God gives you a promise. It's a promise that my wife Cindy and I have clung to for 37 years now, and we will continue to cling to to the day we take our last breath. It's found in Isaiah chapter 41 in verse 10. Fear not. Fear not, Hutch. Fear not, Bill. Fear not, Tom. Fear not, Bob. Fear not, Tim. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. When God says fear not, he never asks us to do something that with his enabling power we cannot do. But he goes on and he says, if I have to, I will pick you up and I will carry you through to the very end. You will make it. The apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians had prayed three times. He had a thorn in the flesh. Lord, take it away. Lord, take it away. Lord, take it away. And God's response to him was this. But he said to me, God speaking to the apostle Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. God says to you today, guys, no matter what you are going through, I got you. And when you go through whatever God is causing or allowing you to go through, you will come out better on the other side. 
you will be a better follower of Jesus Christ. You will be a better father. You will be a better husband. You will be a better son. You'll be a better neighbor. You'll be a better businessman. You'll be a better boss. You'll be a better employee. You will just be a better you. And that's why. And that's how God teaches us compassion as we go through suffering, heartache, and pain. Father, take your word, indelibly etch it into the tablet of our hearts and our minds. May in these next moments that we have a discussion around the table, you move in a mighty way to the praise of your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Let's break to the table. Sounds like we had some good conversation around the tables. I appreciate you guys listening so well and being here today. But, um, you know, normally, normally when Ron's teaching, he comes back and, you know, hey, what did you guys learn? Normally when I finish teaching, come back and make my last point. But I told the table leaders this week that if you would allow me, I'd like to do something different. And uh, I'm not going to teach another point. But I do feel impressed that if you're here today, and you would say, you would be willing to say, um, I'm going through some of those suffering, challenging, trying, difficult days. And you would like for us to pray for you. We'd like to do that as we close out today. And I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you've had some brothers gather around you and lay their hands on you and pray over you and pray for you. Uh, maybe, maybe there's somebody who's normally at your table that because of what they're going through, they're not there today. And, and somebody would stand in as a surrogate and have those prayers. And so in a solemn way of finishing our day today, and uh, how do we, are we cleaning tables up today or what? We're taking everything out today. So, so when we're done, do us a favor. Uh, maybe that small group is going to continue to pray for a little bit. Let's kind of be a little bit more quiet. We want to fold up the chairs and tables today. But uh, if, you, if you would say, uh, brothers, I could, I could really use some prayer today. Would you just stand up right where you are? Anybody? Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Anybody else? All over the room. All over the room. And what I'm going to ask the rest of us to do is would you gather around somebody today? And if you can't physically touch them, you touch somebody that is touching them. And uh, somebody in your group lead out. And in just a few moments, I'm going to come back and close our day out together in prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that as we just take these last few moments together, Father, I pray that you would move in our midst. Lord, there's a lot of things that ask our attention and our focus, but nothing could ever be more important than listening to you. And Father, I pray that in these moments, as we gather around one another and we pray for one another, we lay hands on one another. Lord, I pray that you would bring about healing physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. I pray that, Father, you would help us to, in the midst of the heartache and pain that we are, to see you at work both in us and as a result of it through us. 
Lord, help us to remember, to understand, and to know that you never waste a painful experience in our life. But that, Father, what someday that would be our ministry point of contact with others. I pray, Father, that as each and every one of us are enrolled in your school of compassion, whether we have realized it before today or not, that you are indeed at work. And there is a purpose behind the loss, the heartache, the pain, the suffering, the difficulties that we face. Lord, I pray that you would help us to finish the story well. Lord, may we be testimonies of your redeeming grace. May we be testimonies of the power of faith at work both in us and through us. And Father, I pray that you would raise us up as mighty men who are mighty on our knees before you. For Father, apart from you, we can do absolutely nothing. So Father, we give you these men who have stood and asked for prayer today. For those who aren't here, Father, we pray that you would be at work in their hearts and their lives. May we be a testimony of your grace and of your goodness at work in us and through us. And we will be sure to give you the praise and the honor and the glory for it in Jesus' name. And everyone said together, amen. 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 God bless you guys. Thank you. We'll see you next week. Thank you.